God has brought them hundreds of miles with a supernatural light. But in order to find the Christ, they still need the scriptures. They, they say to him, we saw his star when it arose and we have come to worship him. So let's look at that phrase. We saw his star. Notice there, they don't say we saw the star. These scholars of the sky, they say we saw his star. It was his that we saw. We, star, we saw his star when it rose. Some of your translations, I think the King James says from the east or in the east. That again is an interpretation because literally it says when it rose. Now the reason the King James and others will translate that in the east is because all celestial bodies rise in the east because of the eastward rotation of the earth. So every celestial body, even the moon, rises in the east. But that's not what the text says. It says we saw his star when it rose. We don't know that it rose in the east. In fact, I've often thought, what direction does the star lead them? The star leads them westward. Why would the star rise in the east to lead them westward? But we contemplate that. We speculate that. But we saw his star, his star, when it rose. And we have come, don't miss the purpose here, we have come to worship him. Not we've come to crown him. Not we've come to anoint him. Not that we've come to, to take him back to Persia with us. We've come to worship him. This is the fulfillment of, of the prophecies. This is the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah who would say, it is too small of a thing for you to be the light to Jacob only, but I will make you the light for the nations. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy who would say that God the Father says to the Son, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. This is God the Father bringing to his Son, the King of the Jews, bringing to him the nations to come and to bow down to him, which is a theme of Matthew. One of Matthew's themes is, this is not only the King of the Jews, this is the one that was prophesied that the nations would come and bow down to him. So they say, we, see, we saw his star when it rose. So let's talk about the star because the star, quite frankly, is the most fascinating thing about the whole story because this star really just sparks the, no pun intended, just sparks the imagination there, doesn't it? What was the star and how did the star lead them in such a way? So just like the wise men and everything else about the story, there has been so much unnecessary speculation about what the star could have been. Some have thought that it was a star that went supernova and there's this period of time in which it was really extraordinarily bright and easy to see. Others have speculated that perhaps it was a comet or perhaps it was a meteor or something of that nature. And then others have speculated that it was the convergence of multiple planets together. Who remembers, this goes back a number of years, I want to say maybe 10 or 15, 10 years, maybe 15 years. Who remembers the star of Bethlehem? It was it was a, a, a celestial event, maybe 10 years, 12 years ago, in which there was the convergence, was it three planets that converged together to make a bright light in the night sky? And we were told that that same convergence happened about the, the time of the birth of Christ. And so that was the star of Bethlehem. Well, I don't know exactly what the star was, but I can tell you what the star was not. It was not any of those things because it is abundantly plain in the text that the behavior of the star is nothing like the behavior of any normal celestial body. Because this star led people from one part of the world to another part of the world, and then the star goes on to lead them to a precise house. They travel 500 to 800 miles to be brought to the precise location where the boy was. There is no celestial body, comet, meteor, planet, anything else that behaves in such a way as that. Just think, if you could, if you could see an image, if you could see an image of the closest star and the earth, 
that image would necessarily have the earth so small that it literally could not be represented. Even one pixel would be too small because of the expanse and the size. There's just no way that a celestial body, a normal celestial body will behave in such a way. So these studiers, these scholars of the heavenly bodies, they're calling this a star. But as we ask the question, what does this star, what was the star? We're much better off, I think, instead of asking science or astronomy what the star could have been, let's ask the Bible what the star could have been. And let's see if the Bible can tell us what the star possibly was. Well, as we turn to the Bible and we ask, well, what sort of light in the sky could have been the light that was guiding these magi? We come to find, first of all, that there are numerous places in the Old Testament in which the prophets will speak of lights in the sky in ways that are divine and messianic. Think with me of Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17. This is the prophecy of Balaam. By the way, Daniel would have been well familiar with the prophecy of Balaam. And Daniel could have easily told this prophecy to the Magi. But here's the prophecy. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Daniel would have known that. Daniel also would have known the prophecies of Isaiah, who lived about a hundred years before Daniel, when Isaiah wrote this, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Or from chapter 60, and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So often we see these images of bright lights in the sky and they have a divine meaning or a messianic meaning or both. But then we ask ourselves, wait a minute. Wasn't there another occasion in which a bright light in the sky led God's people? And we say, well, of course there was. From Exodus chapter 13, we all remember the pillar of cloud in the day and the pillar of fire at night. And that pillar of fire did what? It did two things. It illumined the way and it led the way. And so here we see another light in the sky leading the way of God's people. We see that in Exodus chapter 13. But where it really gets particularly interesting for me anyway is when I put these things together and I realize that a great light in the sky accompanied the Son of Man's first coming, just like it will accompany the Son of Man's second coming. From Luke chapter 2 and verse 9, we're familiar with the shepherd account, Luke's account, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord did what? Shone. So here's these shepherds. Up in the sky, there is a host of angelic beings and there is some sort of bright light shining and illumining. That was the first coming of the Son of Man. Now we listen to the words of Jesus from Matthew 24 as he speaks of his second coming. He says, for as the lightning comes from the east and does what? Shines. Does lightning shine? Well, we think of lightning as flashing, don't we? We don't think of lightning as shining. So clearly Jesus is not speaking of a normal bolt of lightning here. He's speaking of something that illumines, something that shines. As far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That word glory in the scriptures oftentimes is connected together with light. So we see the first coming of the Son of Man great light in the sky. The second coming of the the Son of Man, great light in the sky. Here we see a great light in the sky leading God's people to to the child. We also see a great light in the sky leading God's people as far back as Exodus 13. And so we put these things together and we say, clearly this was not a celestial body such as a star proper or a planet. This was some sort of supernatural light in the sky that behaved very differently, that has a very different purpose, and the purpose is to lead them to a specific place. So we continue continue on reading here. Verse 3, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. You see the trouble. You see the agitation is there is an entourage of kingmakers from 
the rival empire here speaking about a king. And verse 4, And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So Herod was not a Jew. He was an Edomite. And so he's not familiar with the Jewish scriptures. He's got to ask. He's where, where the scriptures say that the Christ is going to be born. And they tell him right away. They've got the answer right on the tip of their tongue. Verse 5, they told him, Well, Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So that right there is what it looks like to know the Scriptures and not know the God of the Scriptures. Because that right there is what it looks like to say, oh, you're you're an entourage of Gentiles from the east who are the kingmakers of the next kingdom over, and you're here looking for the king of the Jews? Oh, well, he's down there. He came unto his own, and his own didn't care. Those who were near, those who were 20 miles down the road from him, didn't care. Meanwhile, those who were 800 miles away, those who were far, have been brought near. You think in Ephesians 3, he has brought those who were far, you have now been brought near. So they give this prophecy. This prophecy is pointing them all to Bethlehem. Now, Here's the really crucial thing to see about that. God has led them 800 miles with a supernatural star. But in order to find the Christ, they still need the Word of God. You see that? God has brought them hundreds of miles with a supernatural light. But in order to find the Christ, they still need the Scriptures. So he has brought them all of this way, but it is the word of God. It is only the word of God that is about the living word of God that can take them the final leg of their journey. Then verse seven, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent to them. And that, by the way, that's another clue that some time has passed because we know that he's going to designate two years and younger. So perhaps the Jesus, uh, the child Jesus is as much as a year and a half or two years old at this point, maybe six months old, but he's not an infant anymore. And verse 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. You liar. Now verse 9, And listening to the king, they went their way, which is what tells me that the interpretation of wise men how some of our Bibles, the ESV included, will take the word magi and include wise men, that's, a, that's not a very good interpretation because they're not very wise here, are they? Herod duped them. They were fooled. They were duped. God saves them, but they were duped by Herod. So listening to the king, listening to his words, they went their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So clearly it's not behaving anything like a normal celestial body. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That phrase there, I love it when the gospel writers just seem to trip over themselves to describe a level of joy and celebration that just doesn't seem to fit into words. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They weren't just glad. They weren't just happy. They weren't just saying, we're glad this this is a long trip. We're glad the trip is over. Now we can get this over and go back home. They were exceedingly joyful. The contrast here is to contrast their joy and their excitement to Herod's anger. And that's the contrast that we see in all of life. Because the the coming of the Son of Man divides all of humanity. And it divides all of humanity by their reaction to His coming. We either love His appearing or we hate his appearing. So here's the division. They are exceedingly with, exceedingly rejoicing with great joy, verse 11, and going into the house. So again, clearly some time has passed. So they go into the house. There's no mention of a stable. In fact, there's no mention anywhere in either of the accounts of a stable. So there's one more part of your nativity set that you're just going to have to overlook because there's no mention anywhere of a stable. The most likely place that Mary and Joseph stayed the night of the birth would have been an attachment to a house that was intended to house the animals. 
So in this day and time, everybody traveled by animals, and so most houses had something attached to them to accommodate the animals, particularly houses that were located in cities. And so they were looking for a place to rent. The, uh, the innkeeper said everything's full, and we know there's, there, there wasn't Motel 6s or actual inns, but what happened was people would rent part of people's houses. They would rent a, a space on the floor to sleep. So the regular part of the house was full, so most likely they were given the part where the animals were, which is why the manger was handy to put the, the, the infant in, the infant Jesus when he was born. Now, now maybe the census has all been wrapped up and the big influx of people into Bethlehem from the census, all that sort of passed now. And now the house that they were staying in the animal portion of, maybe, maybe now they've moved into the inner part of it, or maybe they've moved to another house that became available. But whatever the case may be, it's not a stable, it's not a cave, it's a house. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. So two things to make note of there. One is the word translated child, is the word paideon. And that word is always translated young boy or servant. So it's never the word for infant or newborn. It's either the word for young boy or most, most commonly servant. So Jesus is at least a few months old by this point. The other thing to see is they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Now, it might not seem like a, a big thing to take note of here, but it is worth our observing that every time Jesus is mentioned together with his mother, he comes first. It's never Mary and the child. It's always the child and his mother. Just one little clue there that the gospel writers are saying, which of the two was the important one? They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped. What's that next word? Him. That right there, it's easy to look over this, but that right there is the clearest refutation of the heretical Roman Catholic doctrine of Mary. Because if there was ever an instance in all of your scriptures in which God wanted to say to us that Mary holds a special place, this is it. If there was ever an instance in which God wanted to communicate that Mary is deserving of some sort of special attention or something bordering on worship, here are the people from the east and the child is still small. And there's the caretaker, there's the mother, there's the mother of God. And yet their worship is not directed toward her at all. They fall down and they worship the child. So they worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So all three of these gifts are prophetic. We could spend a whole message on the gifts, but we won't do that. We'll just go quickly to the three gifts the three gifts, gold, first of all, gold was the gift of kings. That was the property of kings. And these are the king makers coming to the king. So it's appropriate to give him gold, which by the way, many people speculate that Joseph and Mary, who are destitute at this point, you know, they, they couldn't afford the lamb for the sacrifice. So they gave the dove. Joseph is out of work. They're about to flee to Egypt. So it's often been speculated that that was... How, that was what financed their trip, which is quite possible. So they give him gold. They give him frankincense. Now, frankincense is a, an, an aromatic resin that is harvested from a special tree in Arabia. So it's not native to Israel at all, but it's native to Arabia. And the way that it's harvested is you would go to the special tree and you'd make a cut and go away for about 30 days. And that cut would then bleed resin. And as the resin bled out, it would crystallize on the outside. It's pretty, pretty fascinating, actually. It crystallizes on the outside, and then it continues to bleed resin on the inside. And the crystallized outer part keeps the resin on the inside liquid. And then you go and you pull the bulb off. It's in balls. You pull this little ball off, and it's hard crystal, crystal on the outside, but very aromatic resin on the inside. And so it is very aromatic, but only when it's crushed. And so there's something to do with the prophecy there. The, the God who would crush his son and by the crushing of his son, the aroma of his sacrificial death is made known. So there's the frankincense, but then there's the myrrh and the myrrh is the most highly prophetic of all the three gifts. So the myrrh, it was, it was a, a, a spice 
And the way that myrrh was used in Jesus's day was twofold. There was two uses of myrrh. Both of these show up in the same incident in Jesus's life later. The first use of myrrh was as an, a type of anesthesia. It could be taken orally and it would produce some lessening of physical pain. And so you remember, as they offered Jesus on the cross wine mixed with myrrh and he refused it. The second use of myrrh is it's very aromatic, very strong smelling. And so it was used as an embalming agent to disguise the odor of a decaying body. And you might remember as Jesus was placed into the tomb, he was placed into the tomb with a large amount of myrrh to disguise the, the smell. So both of those uses of myrrh point to the same event in Jesus's life, his sacrificial suffering and death and his being placed into the tomb. Now, there is a further connection that I find quite interesting. I'll share it with you. I find this quite interesting, and that's what the Hebrew rabbis understood myrrh as. The, the association that the Hebrew rabbis had with myrrh was to associate it not just with death, but with sacrificial death. And here's why. The word myrrh in Hebrew is mor, M-O-R. And you might be familiar with a mountain in Israel, by the name of Mount Moriah, literally mountain of myrrh. What happened on Mount Moriah? Anybody remember? Abraham goes up the mountain to sacrifice his son, Isaac, and God spares him by supplying the ram. And so the rabbis had grown to associate myrrh with Abraham's act of sacrificial, sacrificially offering his son. And here are Now the kingmakers saying, these are our gifts. All of these gifts speak to your kingship. They speak to your sacrificial death that is to come. And then finally, verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So God clearly communicates to the Magi through means other than the star. He communicates to them them through their dreams and he communicates to them to leave and depart by another way. So just one last observation. And this is an observation that many have made. It is to say this. What Matthew means is they went home a different direction. But can't we also see something else in there that tells us once the Magi have found the Christ, their way is different now. Can you see that? They find the Christ but they don't go home the same way they came. And isn't that metaphorically speaking something to us about our encounter with Christ? When we encounter Him, we don't go the same way. We don't go home the same way we came. We don't leave the same way. We're not the same people. We truly are, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, new creations in Christ. Now that's not exactly what Matthew was saying, but isn't that a helpful thing to round out this portion of the story to say, These magi came 800 miles, but their way home, their trip home, can you imagine their conversations on the way home? Can you imagine what they spoke of on the way home? This man is the one of whom Daniel spoke, and they were never the same again. 